I got uh, Spencer's directions this morning and his example, so I will ignore the carefully wrought introductions I, I prepared uh, for our esteemed panel. And I've chosen three things I want to say about each. Uh, let me begin with Maro Properzi, who is our first speaker. Uh, you can tell from your, uh, uh, you can get the name, rank, and serial number from your programs. I want to tell you that uh, Maro specializes in, of course, the history and theology of Mormonism, but with a particular interest in the, its resonance with Catholicism. He's a comparative scholar. He has published also on such topics as the emotional dimension of religious experience and also um, on uh, his interests lie in ecumenical studies. He brings all of those to bear on his paper that he'll deliver today, he promises, in 18 minutes. So please start standing at 18 because um, 18 minutes. His paper is Truth, Community, and Prophetic Authority. Uh, next uh, is Terrell Givens, the incomparable Terrell Givens. Again, you can see his, you can see his basic information. But I think what often gets overlooked about Terrell is his training in Romanticism, 19th century cultural studies, as uh, literature and literary theory, uh, the British and Romantic, uh, British and European Romanticism. You're to be forgiven if you don't know that. Since 1997, he's directed his talents to illuminating Mormon history, culture, and theology. Uh, his forthcoming volumes, which I'm sure many of you are waiting for, are the second volume of his History of Mormon Thought, this one called Feeding the Sheep, Foundations of Mormon Practice, the Sacraments, Authority, Gifts, and Worship. Today, he revisits one of his earliest, theme, earliest themes with his paper on the Poetics of Prejudice. And finally, uh, for our prepared papers, Philip Barlow, who has pride of place among those of us who are invited to, uh, to direct some of these uh, Mormon Studies initiatives. He was appointed the Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University in 2007. He specializes in American religious history, religious geography, and Mormonism. His writings have helped us understand not only geography, and that was, uh, those of you who don't know about this work, um, it was, it's, it's a prodigious work, um, placing uh, American religion in its place. Um, but he's also written about concepts of time in secular and religious society and the problems of suffering. I think, I debated whether to say this, but I think those of you who know him know this is true. He is the still small voice among our crowd. Uh, he's, he's held many, he's held many uh, positions of leadership, including president of the Mormon History Association and directorships, et cetera, et cetera. But I must stop now, and uh, I will introduce our commentator as soon as these papers are through. So 15 minutes, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, five years ago, I was honored by the invitation to speak at a colloquium in honor in honor of our friend and colleague, uh, Richard Bushman. I'm honored today to have been invited again and already look forward to his 90th birthday colloquium in five years. Um, I, like many of you, consider Richard a mentor who has often shown us the way in navigating the challenging interaction of scholarship and faith uh, or of Mormonism in the academy. Indeed, the marriage of Mormon faith and academic scholarship is not always happy and mutually satisfying pointing to a path that is not necessarily clear or inevitably rewarding. Attention is inherent to this relationship, and Richard knows this quite well, since he certainly felt the poles of the two ends of the spectrum of his rough stone rollings readership. Still, the interaction is worth pursuing. The benefits are real, and the tension can and ought to be a fruitful, fruitful one, especially for Mormon intellectuals. Perhaps faith versus scholarship is the paradox that encapsulates all the other Mormon paradoxes proposed by Terrell Givens. And as such, it is worth our focus and analysis. If nothing else, the way we experience it or come to terms with it can tell us much about ourselves, including where we are and where we may be going in our identity. I'd like to reflect upon a few aspects of this tension and argue that a permanent resolution of this paradox is not necessarily ideal. This is not to say that a level of peace and stability in approaching issues of faith and scholarship is unreachable or undesirable. 
coherence and honesty can consistently ground our voice in these discussions. Yet there may be times when uh, Tertullian's famous quipping about the disconnect between Christianity and Greek philosophy, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem, will apply to our attempts to integrate Mormonism in the academy. In this context, my desire is to speak about three interconnected dimensions that ground this intersection and give it complexity, truth, community, and prophetic authority. I begin with a conversation I once had with Richard in the early days of my employment at BYU. I met with him for lunch and asked him for advice. His response to a new religion teacher was brief and to the point, teach the truth. On another occasion at a faith and knowledge conference, Richard responded to a question with a comment that may appear to contradict or at least qualify his focus on the centrality of truth. He claimed to be, are you ready for this? A postmodern. As you know, many have tried to define postmodernism and ultimately there are as many definitions as there are postmoderns, but there's one commonality, namely skepticism toward claims of absolute or universal truths or to put it in a slogan, down with meta-narratives. I do not want to project my own thoughts and intentions onto Richard, so you can ask him directly whether he would still make that claim and what he means by it. I can only offer my own reflections on what I indeed see as an uneasy coexistence, the resolute pursuit of truth, even universal truth on the one hand, and carefulness, critical thinking, and contextualization of its expression, even skepticism on the other. Philosophy, religion, science, and knowledge are human modes of discourse with external reference which are colored by the inherent characteristics of humanity. So the complexity and tension is all in the human being and in his limitations to experience truth in ways that are not in some way self-referential. While this may sound obvious to some and utterly false to others who, for example, don't value religion or divine revelation as reference of truth, it is a reminder of an equality of sort between science and religion. The point is that the same tendencies, the same dogmatism, the same cynicism toward whatever is perceived as set threatening a central perspective that makes up our identity may be found in both, clothed in religious or academic language depending on the occasion. Thus, in affirming both truth and postmodernism, I affirm the reality of truth, whether contextualized or absolute, and the reality of the human filter in perceiving it using it and applying it to both positive and negative ends. When we speak about the human, we cannot limit ourselves to psychology, but clearly need to include sociology. Knowledge as a human pursuit is always socially contextualized, if nothing else as a result of the language and categories we employ to describe it, as well as the methods and assumptions that we use to explore it. They all emerge from a social context that cannot be fully transcended. Furthermore, we all belong to several epistemic communities. In other words, the acquisition of information that is necessary for the formation and recognition of truth is usually connected to meaning-making communities which provide and interpret information in ways that are usually self-reinforcing. It is one of the characteristics of modern societies to accommodate belonging to several such communities so our social epistemology becomes inherently complex as the values, goals, assumptions, and data of these various communities interact within thinking individuals, at times smoothly, but often strenuously. The interaction between Mormonism as a religious community of faith and the academy as an intellectual community of knowledge is only one such interaction, which in turn overlaps with other cultural, political, and effective communities that shape our identity. It follows that as a key defining characteristic of individuals, groups, and societies, truth often functions as a means to an end and not as an end in itself. The question remains on whether the ends pursued are good or bad. Postmodern critiques hold absolutistic or universalistic views of truth to be naive because they fail to recognize the self-referential dimension of knowledge. Some of these critiques also emphasize the negative dimension of truth agendas by placing power in good Nietzschean fashion as the very center of the picture. I cannot fully reject these perspectives because they do describe dimensions of reality that are before our eyes, both in individuals and in communities, if we're truly honest, even in ourselves. 
My LDS theological anthropology in some ways supports this descriptive recognition by affirming that the human in his natural state is an enemy to God. So it is to be expected that the ego-centered fallen individual will manifest these tendencies in the pursuit, possession, and communication of truth, which are important identity-shaping activities of daily existence. Yet this same theological anthropology teaches me that we are a dynamic rather than static, we are dynamic rather than static beings that our roots and destiny are greater than empty self-focus and that we can transcend or put off this natural man by following the enticings of the Holy Spirit. In short, the postmodern critique may have value in, dis in a descriptive sense, but not in a proscriptive one or normative one. The sanctifying development of the individual involves both the inside and the outside, the power of God and the agency of man employed in following these transformative corrections. Although ultimately personal, this is a process that happens in and through community with groups emerging both as facilitators and as obstacles of this very development. But individuals and communities are not to be viewed as separate categories of being, at least in the context of the highly relational theology of Mormonism. In an eternal sense, the individual and his family constitute each other, or to put it differently, there is no individual without community and no community without individual. The ultimate ideal is captured in a Godhead whose divine oneness describes a perfect relationship between beings who would cease to be who they are should their social Trinitarian community dissipate. But for us mortals, the picture is not as idyllic. Relationships are often far from ideal. Communities exist in hierarchies of importance and conflicts between individuals and communities or between different communities are common. Still, the dynamic tension between individual and community is central to eternal progression, including the realm of truth acquisition, which is not only assertion of propositional statements, but also expression of an embodied reality. Here, religion appears as somewhat different epistemically than the social sciences or the humanities, not so much in relation to its practitioners, but to its object of study. In God's being, there is a certainty associated with his perfection that would be misplaced if applied to humanity. And while humans can continue to be uncertain about their own perceptive filters of God, the God who has been chosen as an object of faith is firm, unchanging, and certain, not only in his existence, but also in his characteristics. Hence, churches are an interesting mix of humanity and divinity, with divine beginnings and ends rooted in certainty and human filtering rooted in a degree of uncertainty. The certainty and uncertainty are always in tension with each other, particularly in this secular age. Although institutional religions have often emphasized certainty and the exclusive dimension of a particular faith over competing perspectives. This is also true of Mormonism and of the epistemic community associated with it. Indeed, the epistemology that emerges from the Mormon mil milieu is characterized by at least two interrelated paradoxes, the individual versus the community on the one hand and divine certainty versus human uncertainty on the other. Then if both the individual and the community are central subjects and instruments in the pursuit of truth, but if both are subject to corruptions and deviations from the ideal spiritual trajectory that leads to truth, what makes Mormon epistemology distinctive? Relatedly, what does the Mormon epistemic community have to offer to shore up its members from the dangers of both self-focused conscience and group dynamics gone awry? Let me propose at least one answer, although there may be many. The prophetic authority claimed by the prophet Joseph Smith and his successors. Visions, new scriptures, a restored church, saving ordinances, priesthood authority, to name only a few examples, made Mormonism a religion that through his prophet dared to claim possession of a new, pure, direct line of communication with God. The radical claim of being an authoritative epistemic community that had bridged the gap between the sacred and the banal through divine intervention was exclusive in focus and to many offensive in its implications. These epistemic claims were and continue to be central to the emergent survival and international growth of the faith. Mormonism boldly pro proclaims that God has spoken again to a prophet in modern times and that a preferred channel of communication between heaven and earth has been established through the restoration of Christ's church and his priesthood authority. And although no church prophet who has succeeded Smith has ever been considered equal to him in terms of revelatory production or prophetic charisma, 
The church has continued to teach that prophetic authority, namely the right to function as God's primary mouthpiece on the earth, is invested in the living prophet. Prophetic expressions have changed in their content, context and expression, but the same expectation exists now as it existed then. If there is anything that the Lord wants his church to know, practice or change, the primary channel of communication will be God's prophet as assisted by the other 14 men, prophets, seers, and revelators that constitute the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 apostles. At the same time, a recognition of prophetic authority within Mormonism does not invariably lead to prophetic infallibility, fideism, blind obedience, or tribal mentality. Mormons are not asked to follow their leaders blindly or place all responsibility for sacred knowledge upon their prophets and apostles. They're taught that theirs are souls in the path of eternal progression, where personal acquisition of knowledge through assistance of and sensitivity to the power and influence of the spirit is crucial to such development. Hence, individual study and agency, character growth, conscientious obedience, and working things out in one's mind and heart are inherently personal processes that must accompany any institutional guidance that emerges from church authorities. For a fully engaged Mormon, thoughtless following of any authority, whether secular, spiritual, or academic, is never a real option. Still, prophetic pronouncements provide parameters that call for both respect and attention. What then if truth community and prophetic authority come to clash with each other? A useful organizing principle in addressing these tensions may be the concept of conscience formation, which is prevalent in Catholic moral theology. According to this view, conscience is the internal compass of individual decision making where reason, God, knowledge, community, values, and desires intersect and in interact. As such, it represents the ultimate subjective norm of human behavior. At the same time, conscience is not immune to error, is in need of constant development of formation, and calls for personal responsibility in bringing about progress. From the church's perspective, a well-formed conscience will be rooted in scriptures, the teachings of the church, and the inspiration of the spirit, thus becoming more fully moral than if built exclusively on principles of reasons. Mormons would use somewhat different terms to describe it, but uh, the substance of the message is largely similar. The late Catholic theologian and Cardinal Every Dulles wrote perceptively about conscience and its relation to authority. He reiterated the centrality of conscience to individual judgment while also adding that conscience is not autonomous because it cannot speak responsibly unless it has been properly educated. People will obviously differ when identifying the sources that lead to a proper education of conscience, but most would agree that conscience has as much to do with the nature of the information that is being processed as it does with the processing of the same. Indeed, information does not usually enter individual consciences as neutral to begin with, since it is generally already colored by origin, associations, relationships to existing desires and values, etc. Hence, processing and receptivity are inherently connected and often mutually reinforcing. In other words, truth statements are contextualized in epistemic communities toward which individuals feel more or less loyalty as a result of their sense of identity. Hence, Dulles continues, the relationship between authority and personal judgment may be described as dialectical. That is to say, the two are neither identical nor separate. Our personal convictions about what is right and wrong are at least partially shaped by what the community and its leaders have taught us, and on the basis of those convictions, we determine whether to follow the community's authorities in a given instance. This is not only true of religious communities, but also of political, cultural, or family communities, and certainly of academic ones. What then, in conclusion, are the boundaries of the Mormon epistemic community, and what do these boundaries mean for LDS intellectuals and the formation of their conscience. Michael Otterson, prior managing director of public affairs for the church, recently reminded us that the boundaries are broad and that the tent is large, while also emphasizing that there are clear doctrinal boundaries, covenants, commandments, and divine claims that are stable, non-negotiable, and foundational to the meaning of the word Mormon. Within this context, prophetic authority plays a significant role in setting and reinforcing boundaries or in opening them up to adjustment and change. Mormon intellectuals can play a part in the defense of these boundaries, in their conceptualizations, in the evolution of their adjustments as they operate within the framework provided. LDS scholars may even provide a key impetus to such changes, as Richard's experience seems to indicate. 
As a historian of Mormonism, Richard challenged the cultural practice, often institutionalized in LDS educational curricula, of presenting Joseph Smith only through the lenses of hagiography. Partially as a result of his endeavors, we now live in an era of unprecedented church openness about the Joseph Smith of history. Things would have been different had Richard challenged any of the key doctrines of Mormonism, such as, for example, Joseph Smith's prophetic calling. Then the importance of conscience formation is rooted in our capacity to recognize the sources of our truth claims, the influence of our epistemic communities, our existing hierarchies of loyalty, and the difference between provisional knowledge and foundational truths. This process is inherently challenging and never ending because those of us who are both Mormons and academics are called to remain open to all truth, to challenge individual and communal tendencies to co-opt or corrupt it, and to keep purifying our own motivations in pursuing it. Then the tension will continue, but it will be a fruitful one, even a desired one. Yes, there is both truth and uncertainty, or to put it in Gandhi's words, I think it is wrong to expect certainties in this world where all else but God, that is truth, is an uncertainty. All that appears and happens about and around us is uncertain, transient, but there is a supreme being hidden therein as a certainty, and one would be blessed if one could catch a glimpse of that certainty and hitch one's wagon to it. The quest for that truth is the summum bonum of life. Thank you. Certainly wonderful to be here today as part of this uh, amazing convocation of Mormon and non-Mormon voices. I, uh, I want to speak today about the integration of faith and scholarship. Actually, I want to explicate and justify what is perhaps inevitable, happily, about their integration. And I want to do this by building upon a claim made by the philosopher Georg, Hans Georg Gadamer, a claim that positions prejudice, or vorurteil, at the heart of intellectual inquiry. It's a long quote from his philosophical hermeneutics, but it's worth listening to in its entirety. Quote, it can be shown that the concept of prejudice did not originally have the meaning we have attached to it. Prejudices are not necessarily unjustified and erroneous, so that they inevitably distort the truth. In fact, the historicity of our existence entails that prejudices in the literal sense of the word, constitute the initial directedness of our whole ability to experience. Prejudices are the basis of our openness to the world. They are simply conditions whereby we experience something, whereby what we encounter says something to us. But how do we know that the guest whom we admit is one who has something new to say to us? Is not our expectation and our readiness to hear the new also necessarily determined by the old that has already taken possession of us." Close quote. I want to look more closely at two of these inspired segments of what I call Gadamer's Poetics of Prejudice and consider how they apply to scholarship and faith. So first, he calls prejudice the initial directedness of our whole ability to experience or the conditions of experience. We can no more find and secure meaning in the absence of this kind of prejudice than we could find the traction to run or the breath to sing in the vacuum of space. Gadamer's prejudice, or vorurteil, I take to mean the hypothesis with which we launch ourselves into the project of life. Max Scheler expresses the principle beautifully but rigorously as a philosopher of cognition. He writes, how do we even know reality as something independently existent. There is no specific sensation, hard, firm, etc., that gives us the impression of reality. What gives us reality is the experience of resistance against the lowest and most primitive levels of our psychic life. Just as this sensation of resistance, not just tactile but cognitive, is our proof of a world outside the mind, so is the tension between our intellectual predispositions and the resistance that they provoke from alien voices. So are those the only antidote, that, or that tension is the only antidote to blind certainty, smugness, and solipsism. Prejudice, predisposition, a ground of judgment, 
is the provocation that invites challenge and rebuttal in any discursive community. We are no blank slate, and any attempt to emulate one is both self-deceptive and dangerous. The illusion of a neutral ground from which intellectual inquiry can proceed is a relic of Enlightenment optimism. We don't need to be postmoderns, like Richard, to recognize, as Nietzsche observed wryly, only the animal lives unhistorically. Not only are we situated in history and culture, but our history and our culture are always eradicably situated in us. Nonetheless, the illusion persists when it serves our purposes, and its invisibility can confound our best efforts at consensus or even progress in intellectual matters. To illustrate, let me take as just one case in point Alistair McIntyre's diagnosis of the conceptual chaos that reigns in our contemporary culture's conversations about morality. He points out, for instance, that moral discourse was once at home in and intelligible in terms of a context of universally shared practical beliefs and supporting habits of thought, feeling, and action, a context that has long been lost. The essence of all prior presuppositions underlying moral discourse was, he says, a teleological scheme in which there is a fundamental contrast between man as he happens to be and man as he could be. Ethics is the science which is to enable men to understand how they make the transition from the former state to the latter. Ethics, therefore, in this view, presupposes some shared account of potentiality and act, some shared account of the essence of the human as a rational animal, and above all, some account of the human telos, or the end toward which we are striving. Now contrast these Aristotelian and Thomistic assumptions so conformable with a Mormon anthropology with those evident in a recent critique by the scholar Judith Poxon, who protests, quote, any idealized image that would function as a goal for becoming cannot help but retain a normativity that dominates the process of subjectification. I know, why do scholars have to talk like that? What, what she is saying is simple. Ideals are oppressive. Or as I heard a student protest at a conference where I shared the table with Richard, but to impose standards is to be elitist and exclusionary. My point here is that in debates about moral questions especially, we cannot even begin a conversation without already always espousing a human teleology or condemning all human teleology as normatizing and thus oppressive. Arguments about so many moral dilemmas in our current climate will never be genuinely productive until participants can recognize and acknowledge that first premises have already been staked out in this regard, though they are generally unarticulated. Now, Mormons enter the many worlds of discourse with a fairly large set of theological positions, or prejudices, that pertain not just to human teleology, but human origins, divine ontology, and everything in between. But the conspicuousness of Mormon theological eccentricities and our all-pervading tendency to conflate the heavenly and the earthly, to integrate the spiritual and the intellectual, has made LDS scholars, I believe, unduly self-conscious about the prejudices we bring to the academic table. Some, of course, may be too little self-conscious. That's another discussion. This is why I believe that many Latter-day Saint scholars are guilty of provincial anti-provincialism. The expression is Gene England's, but I fear it remains a peculiarly Mormon affliction. It can manifest itself as a prompt readiness to play on an uneven playing field so that we don't look like whiners. It can manifest itself as a refusal to ask questions that are especially meaningful to us. It can manifest itself as forgetfulness that we inherit disciplines, but we also have the power to shape them. Think of David's comments a few minutes ago about challenging disciplinary binaries. It can manifest as a phobia that we need to bracket our heritage or inherited wisdom or core beliefs instead of letting them be the prejudices that shape the starting point of our investigations and researches. As Charles Taylor comments, experience is that wherein our previous sense of reality is undone, refuted, and shows itself needing to be reconstituted, whereas the aim of science is to take us beyond experience. But we are not scientists. We are engaged in a humanistic enterprise. And again, quoting Taylor, who is reading Gautamer, bracketing out human meanings from human science means understanding nothing at all. 
Some of the most prominent scholars in religious studies certainly manifest no such insecurities and deference to faded Enlightenment boogeymen. Marie Griffith has used the expression critical empathy to acknowledge the limitations and the complementary strength of both insider and outsider perspectives. As she writes, the lived worlds of human experience, after all, are not identical to people's descriptions of those worlds. This is usually interpreted to mean listening respectfully to the insider perspective while critiquing it from the outside. But I think it can work in reverse. Faithful scholars can listen respectfully to the outside perspective while critiquing it from the inside. As when Mormons must credit as reasonable, the non-Mormon academic consensus that the Book of Mormon is a 19th century work, or their seeking for naturalistic explanations of Smith's prophetic output. Robert Orsi begins his work between heaven and earth by situating his study in the midst of his own engagement with dying relatives, prayers to saints, and angelic presences. Bart Ehrman begins one of his more popular books by taking us through a deeply personal and subjective account of his deconversion from evangelical Christianity. Meanwhile, Raymond Brown begins his magisterial work on the New Testament by telling us he is a believing Catholic. Clifford Geertz has coined the term eyewitnessing, referring to the trend in one critic's eyes of scholars flaunting their subjectivity and thereby acknowledging that any pretense of objectivity is naive, if not deceitful. Yet Mormon scholars frequently seem to buy into the notion that some kind of feigned objectivity, sprinkled with liberal doses of self-directed cynicism, is the price of admission to the club. Let me give two examples from outside the humanities of where we find scholars in the hard sciences operating from first premises that can easily be deconstructed into faith premises, some with greater fidelity to Gautamer than others. First, the self-proclaimed atheist cosmology David Rees. In his engagement with much discussed and debated anthropic principle, this is the recognition that the universe seems ideally configured miraculously for the appearance of human life. Uh, in his engagement, he reviews six cosmological parameters in particular that together constitute the necessary conditions for the formation of stars and planets and the evolution of human life. All six of these numerical values that he studies, from the mass of the universe to the ratio of gravity to nuclear forces, are defined with exquisite precision. Some carried 120 places after a decimal point. And in each case, even the smallest deviation from the observed value would be catastrophic for potential life in the universe. Now, Reese concedes that the mathematical probability of such cosmic fine-tuning is near enough to zero that given the limited prehistory of our universe, the chances of a coincidental convergence of such parameters is effectively nil. Desperate to account in non-religious terms for the fact that we are, obviously, palpable proof of such a virtually impossible convergence, he finds refuge in the hypothesis of the multiverse. As he reasons, if an infinite number of universes exist, then a virtual impossibility becomes a, stati a statistical inevitability. So we posit a, literal inf a literally infinite plurality of universes, and in the midst of this plethora, we are delighted, but not dumbfounded, to find that we exist as an instance of winning an almost but not fully impossible cosmic lottery. The only problem which he is honest enough to concede is that a multiverse is a non-testable hypothesis. He has had to depart from the realm of science in order to preserve what is clearly an original predisposition against God theories. As he writes, whether the convergence of such astronomically improbable fine-tuning is coincidence or the providence of a benign creator, I reject both. An infinity of universes could exist where the numbers are different. So here a renowned scientist finds no shame in making an original prejudice, the absolutely no design behind creation thesis, the basis for resorting to an effectively religious explanation to avoid the alternative of a conventionally religious explanation. Now a second example I want to use of a prejudice operating in a more fruitful way is from the work of the theoretical physicists Hermann Weyl, Paul Dirac, and Frank Wilczek. Their brilliant colleague Freeman Dyson relates their shared prejudice. Wilczek believes that the basic laws of nature must be beautiful, and therefore a theory that is beautiful has a good chance of being true. Wilczek points to several famous examples from the history of physics when theories designed to be beautiful turned out to be true. The best known examples are the Dirac wave equation for the electron and the Einstein theory of general relativity. Hermann Weyl, who was one of the main architects of the relativity and quantum revolutions, said once, I always try to combine the true with the beautiful, but when I have to choose one or the other, I choose the beautiful. 
And Dirac arranged what had seemed an unlikely marriage between quantum physics and Einstein's theory of relativity in the form of an exquisitely beautiful equation. And soon afterwards, with no experimental clues to prompt him, he used his equation to predict the existence of antimatter. The success of this prediction is by wide agreement one of the most outstanding triumphs of theoretical physics. So those were all examples of how even in the hard sciences, scientists in acknowledged or unacknowledged ways always begin with an inherited prejudice. I want to now turn to my second part, which is how does a prejudice serve as the basis of openness? If the illusion of an enlightenment ideal of impersonal objectivity with its value neutral groundwork and purity from any contamination by faith commitments is the charybdis of faithful scholarship. A too tenacious adherence to prejudice is, of course, the scylla. Gadamer's poetics of prejudice emphasize the before judgment, the for oratile, as the basis of openness and readiness. And this is what he has to say about such openness. No assertion is possible that cannot be understood as an answer to a question, but any experience of life can confirm the fact that there is such a thing as intellectual sterility, that is, the application of a method to something not really worth knowing, to something that has not been made an object of investigation on the basis of a genuine question. Now, I love that expression, the genuine question. Gautamer elaborates on this marvelous phrase in another work, Truth and Method. He says, a genuine question is one where our own prejudice is brought into play by being put at risk. A genuine question is a question we ask at personal risk. This is one of those intersections where pure religion and intellectual integrity powerfully align. Openness to risk may in fact prove a useful, useful differentiator between apologetics, so-called, and a more religious studies-oriented scholarship. Apologetics, like cult, may be a term that has been too deformed in contemporary discourse to be a useful designation. Its semiotic value is too encumbered with pejorative connotations that overlay its distinguished history. And like cult, it has been wielded as a cudgel to discredit and dismiss under the guise of applying some kind of objective rhetorical label. But of course, since all academic activities involve formal ar argumentation and defense of a position, we are all in this room apologists of a sort. So let me say instead that Gautamer's genuine question, which exposes the interrogator to genuine risk, should be the hallmark of any work done in the field of religious studies by a secularist or by a committed believer. And in its absence, we may find the kind of work that deserves the label of apologetic in the worst sense. Paul Johnson recognized the problem of genuineness and risk as they pertain to Christian scholarship. And as I read his words, just substitute the word Mormon for Christian to see how powerful this point is. Christianity, he said, is essentially a historical religion. It bases its claims on the historical facts it asserts. If these are demolished, it is nothing. Now, can a Christian or a Mormon examine the truth of these facts with the same objectivity he would display toward any other phenomenon? Can he be expected to dig the grave of his own faith if that is the way his investigations point? In the past, very few Christian scholars have had the courage or the confidence to place the unhampered pursuit of truth before every other consideration. But a Christian with faith has nothing to fear from the facts. A Christian historian who draws the line limiting the field of inquiry at any point whatsoever is admitting the limits of his faith. Founding a religion in the age of printing, as Von Brody noted, complicated Joseph Smith's program and ours enormously. Because we are now like the proverbial lawyer, having to ask questions we do not always know the answer to but recognizing the answers are usually part of the record if we dig deeply enough. This kind of faithful scholarship invites, it does not run from, vulnerability. Not all of the investigations of LDS scholars may redound successfully. Research into mountain meadows and the priesthood doctrine have revealed more difficulties than resolution. But without espousing ourselves to losing battles in the short run, we cannot venture forth with the courage necessary to obtain the prize in the long run. Paul Ricoeur finds this kind of risk goes to the heart of Christian discipleship. He writes, the philosophical progression from religion to faith involves a purification of man's desire for, for protection. And in the book of Job, we find that un unadulterated faith in God is described as a tragic faith 
beyond any assurance of protection. If intellectual work is to be, as Latter-day Saints profess, a type of worship, then it must exhibit not just effort and rigor, it must manifest the highest form of faith, which is that trust and confidence that lays one open to disappointment. It must be the faith that constitutes and manifests vulnerability. There is an earned innocence, says one of Marilyn Robinson's characters, which is as much to be honored as the innocence of children. Thank you. I think my sneaky friend Kathleen meant to find a guise of graciousness while she persecuted my reticence, but in introducing me the way she did, I gotta tell you it's a lot of responsibility to be this still small voice. <laughs> I'm trying to process what that means for you at the end of a long afternoon, but I think it translates to listen up. Two score and seven years ago, our fathers, one of our intellectual mothers and fathers, brought forth on this continent a new conception of historical method dedicated to the proposition that Mormon scholars might meld their religious perspectives and a theory of history better to understand the workings of peoples and nations. Richard Bushman's essay, Faithful History, appeared in an early issue of Dialogue one year after he had accepted the Bancroft Prize. The essay anticipated by three decades George Marsden's work that treated related themes and culminated in his book, The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship, 1997, which incited a debate that spilled beyond academic circles to public outlets, such as the New York Times. It is only Richard's concluding thought that I shall attempt to engage at this moment. He asserts that one cannot improve as a historian without improving as a person. This is because moral insight, spiritual commitment, and critical intelligence entwine. Then comes his last line, inverting Joseph Smith's well-known teaching that man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge. Bushman's inversion reads, we gain knowledge no faster than we are saved. Is this true? My own rumination on this notion is experimental in positing that there is an epistemic component to each of our caricature, caricature, caricature traits, not caricature traits, character traits. I'm about to zoom in the lens by sketching specific ways in which this may work. Note, please, that I am not talking about the alleged turn in the practice of history, the moral turn in the practice of history during the past decade or so, which can mean variously a moral judgment on the part of the historian or a study in choices and actions of historical actors themselves or the attempt to recreate the moral tone of a particular time and place. All this could prove relevant, but it is not my theme here. Nor am I alluding simply to a scholar's values. While related, the topic I address is more elemental and personal than either values or ethics, something deeper, something beneath even one's self-conscious identity. Ethics and values tend often to flow from one's self-identity, self but I speak rather of character, whether or not one is conscious of its components. I confess that I am drawn to the notion that character impinges on what and how we can know. That is, if a scholar shows courage or cowardice, she is not merely thereby admirable or deplorable, but her traits also condition what she is capable of seeing or sensing, what she is even equipped to look for. Because this thought appeals to me, I am also suspicious of it, lest Freud dispense with me. Several objections spring to mind. I will mention four. 
Some will chafe at the thesis as inherently maudlin, pious, excessively self-conscious. They may insist that our attention rests strictly on our topic, not on the scholar treating it. If our interest is to discern what made the Puritans tick, who cares whether the author of an argument cheats on his wife? This objection may correctly give us pause before the, uh, before the task of judging others, other historians, other scholars, but my interest is in improving my own sight as a scholar. A maudlin byproduct would be an errant result, but not one dictated by exploring personal epistemology. Second, the proposal that character and attitude are intrinsically epistemic may seem sectarian, proffering too much religion and the study of religion. It could do that, doubtless, but such instances would again be distortions, not negations of our thesis. Third, the idea that character affects perspective may seem self-evident, not worth bothering about. Yet while the abstract principle may seem intuitive to some, human character, identity, motivation, and psychology applied to scholarly tasks is a labyrinth, are a labyrinth, and they require reflection. I am arguing. I am not arguing. I don't have time. I am asserting. Finally, other objections may have more merit. Rather than self-evident, the corollary that poor character constricts insight may be simply wrong. Impressive creations of music, art, sport, and science do not seem to hinge on moral rectitude. Why should scholarship? Beyond this, there may be positive epistemic advantages to otherwise contrary trait, traits. Would we read Mark Twain more dearly had he been a cheery fellow? Was it not precisely Twain's curmudgeonly squint toward religion that allowed Huck Finn to cash in his ticket to heaven rather than to cash in his slave friend, Jim? What of the yet more pronounced misanthrope H.L. Mencken? Was he not both grouchy and, hyperbolically at least, correct in proclaiming no virtuous man, that is virtuous in the YMCA sense, has ever painted a picture worth looking at or written a symphony worth hearing? or a book worth reading, and it is highly improbable that the thing has ever been done by a virtuous woman. There is then plausible substance to this objection. Without doubt, much useful scholarship has come forth from morally problematic minds. Given such qualifications, we might attempt an exegesis of, or an amendment to, Richard's last sentence. An exegesis would pivot on what we mean by knowledge and what we mean, we mean by saved. A provisional reconstruction might read something like this. We gain a certain class of historical knowledge, redeeming knowledge, the sort of knowledge that matters most, wisdom, no sooner than we are good enough, evolved enough, redeemed enough to be able to imagine, search for, recognize, apprehend, and apply it. Alas, like any exegesis, this reach for precision is cumbersome and ugly. Repackaged at manageable length, our amendment might read, we gain wisdom no sooner than we are good. But this too seems pale. Good is not quite the same as saved, let alone holy. But even this collapse, this um, we gain wisdom no sooner than we are good. Mars Bushman's poetic cast and its deft inversion of Joseph Smith. So all in all, I will defer to Richard's original line if you will grant me the henceforth silent complications noted to this point. I embrace the idea and want to argue that the iteration of it I am musing on is not an incidental concern for a scholar. Among philosophers, there is even a developing strand devoted to such inquiry. It is called virtue epistemology, though it besieges itself with off-putting jargon. Rather than philosophy, I shall draw my example from science. If these dynamics sometimes operate even in the realm of science, we can more readily see how they might apply in the study of history, religion, and culture. 
The botanist Barbara McClintock was, in 1983, awarded the Nobel Prize for work on maize, by which she revolutionized ideas about genetics with implications for evolutionary processes. Recognition of her accomplishment was tardy. She was a woman in a man's profession, and skepticism of her breakthrough research in the 1940s and 50s induced her to stop publishing her data by 1953. By then, McClintockian had become code for unscientific in some circles. Not until the 1960s and 70s did other scientists better come to understand her work and confirm her demonstrations of genetic mechanisms. McClintock's way of practicing science, her way of thinking about her subject and of relating to her, her corn plants, suggests something of her character as well as her intellect. In what seems a precursor to my lay ears, to what we now call stem cells, McClintock said decades ago, with the tools and the knowledge, I could turn a developing snail's egg into an elephant. It is not so much a matter of chemicals because snails and elephants do not differ that much. It is a matter of timing the actions of the genes. Her critics thought her crazy as a goat. But she said, if you know you're right, you don't care. You know that sooner or later it will come out in the wash. McClintock's relationship to her maze was intimate, caring, one might even say loving, if that will not embarrass all you tough-minded scholars out there. This caring induced an extraordinary attention, a kind of deep listening that teased into the open things otherwise obscure. Listen to a medley of her reflections I've culled from disparate sources. Just because plants sit there, anybody walking down the road considers them just a plastic area to look at as if they're not really alive. To the contrary, plants are extraordinary. For instance, if you pinch a leaf of a plant, you set off an electrical impulse. You can't touch a plant without setting off an electrical impulse. They do a lot of responding to an environment. They can do almost anything you can think of. Indeed, the ability of a cell to sense these broken ends, to direct them towards each other, and then to unite them so that the union of the two DNA strands is correctly oriented, is a particularly revealing example of the sensitivity of cells. They make wise decisions and act on them. What enabled this botanist to see further and deeper than her colleagues? Brains and ambition do not alone explain it. McClintock's own explanation was disarmingly simple. One must have the time to look, the patience to hear what the material has to say to you, the openness to let it come to you. Above all, one must have a feeling for the organism. I start with the seedling and I don't want to leave it. I don't feel I really know the story if I don't watch the plant all the way along. So I know every plant in the field. I know them intimately, and I find it a real pleasure to know them. McClintock insisted that she could write the biography of each of her plants. I suspect that, for her, the veil grows thin between metaphor and literality in her methodological descriptions and prescriptions. I think that is true also of the distinction bef between her now uncontested genius and the traits of character and attitude through which she forged her method. Those traits include curiosity, imagination, courage, independence, confidence in relation to her critics, and toward her subjects an uncommon species of humility, patience, caring, hearing and discerning, born of respect and born of affection. Transposed to the humanities, McClintock's example suggests that scholars may do well to endure a periodic look in the mirror. 
But finding other than surface forms and conventions in a mirror is more difficult than first appears. Augustine demonstrated as much in the fifth century by inventing autobiography as surely as Newton invented calculus to address a problem that the mathematics of his day could not. Augustine produced the first self-life writing that was possessed of a real interior, as opposed to, I, the great one, went here and saw this or conquered this. In his search for God, Augustine first entered an existential crisis, losing himself in time. He reasoned that the future does not exist except by anticipation, and the past does not exist except in memory, and the present does not exist except in the most peculiar way, for it has no extension, no, no time in it. By the time you get to the second syllable, the first syllable is already gone. Where the heck am I? He thought to himself. This existential crisis, when applied uh, both to himself and then in a way to his search in God, led him to breakthroughs. At last, and in imitation of God's eternal creative word, as he believed, Augustine called himself into being in time through this profound autobiographical act, and he thereby, thereby both discovered and crafted a temporal self in an extended present that grappled with an imagined past and future. A mirror has its own traits and dangers. A mirror can distort, a mirror can divert. One may find Narcissus there, but whether or not one notices and makes critical use of the mirror, the mirror helps compromise the imperfect window through which thinkers and scholars discern past and present reality, offering their portraits to the world. Thanks. With thanks to uh, our panelists for their depth of thought and discipline and presentation, it's now a distinct privilege to introduce to you David Hall. Uh, my burden is particularly great here, uh, given my commitment to do this efficiently. I, uh, I am not exaggerating to say that he has, as much as anyone of his day, shaped the field of American religious history its theories and methods, as well as renewing the traditional historiography of English and New England Puritanism. He, uh, in his 30 years of extraordinarily productive scholarship, what stands out to me is his capacity to influence three fields of history, the intellectual, the social, and the cultural, reading each wave of theoretical change without abandoning the, form, the virtues of former skills um, and uh, contributions in our field. That's no small feat. Those of you who throw around the term uh, practice in the field of religious history owe it to this man. Uh, he is indeed a, a, uh, an extraordinary scholar. Uh, we owe it to his close friendship to Richard that he comes to be with us today. He is Richard's peer. And it also shows the generosity and the capaciousness of his intellectual mind that he is willing to reach out into our small star circle with his bright sun. So David, the time is yours. Too much, <coughs> I'm too much of the historian to let one thing she said, Kathleen said, go by. My first book appeared 48 years ago. <laughs> so um, I've gone through various iterations of preparing a commentary, and this one has to be the one that you hear. And the, what's come over me being here and traveling here is that I wanted most of all to reflect on my relationship with the Bushmans, 
Claudia and Richard, uh, which is a long history with some significant uh, intermittencies, but a history that, uh, as it's existed over the past 30 years or longer, there your 30 year period may, 40 years, has involved what I would refer to as a silent or private compassion for each other's life situations and for each other's struggles as historians. So I'm gonna to come to that by, by a circuitous route here, a longer account. Uh, I wanna refer briefly to the three papers, fairly briefly to three papers in contrast to what a proper commentator would have done. I want to say a couple of words about the relationship between faith communities, communities of faith, or what we might call churches or denominations, and the writing of history, about which I have some somewhat critical comments to make. This is in general, not, not LDS specific. Uh, I want to do something, I wanna talk about history as I understand it, what, what, what the historical is. I want to do something that frankly I've never done in this kind of a setting, namely to talk about my own faith journey. And then I wanna talk about its bearing on my work as a historian and finally a few words about, uh, about the Richard and Claudia. So first of all, the papers that you've just heard were, uh, were not as historically specific, how shall I put it, yeah, not as historically specific <laughs> as uh, other papers that we were hearing uh, this afternoon and this morning. Each is deeply rooted in the identities of these three men as Mormon intellectuals. Each has some bearing to their own disciplinary locations, religious studies, for example, in one, and there are uh, references, Robert Orsi, uh, we might say that are particular to certain fields. Each is dealing with uh, doublenesses, uh, uh, the dialectic between the truth and the inevitable, the inevitable fallibilities of churches or communities of faith in our first paper. The second in the very true point, uh, I, I would not have ever thought of using the word prejudice, but the very real point that we are, are mark, we are all marked by our subject position in what we can do, what we can know, what we can accomplish, and on the other hand, are not entirely limited, as Charles Taylor is quoted as saying, by that position. And then finally, the, the, uh, the discussion of the moral or of character here in terms of uh, it's bearing on our, our, our work, our identity, our identity as Christians, our identity as LES members, our identity as thinking people, uh, and the role of conscience in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that dialectic also. I should say that uh, in the 17th century where conscience plays a very, very large role, and the people that I study, conscience plays a very, very large role, it has two quite opposed meanings to the state church doesn't matter which state church to the state church, to England, Scots, New England, to the state church it means conscience is implanted in you by God to show you the truth as it is understood by the church, by God. To those such as Roger Williams who believed immensely in the concept of conscience or to those who opposed in the 1560s in England opposed the Queen's edict that they had to wear the surplus, the priest's surplus, the Catholic from Catholicism, conscience was orienting you with divine law in opposition to what the state said. It overrode what the state said. And this is one of the great issues in early Protestant history that endures right into our own time. Is it the church that can establish the boundaries of conscience? Or is conscience something an independent faculty God has put in each of us to which we must listen even if it leads to martyrdom, no matter what. So that's, I just add that to the, the evocation of conscience that, you, that was made here. So I, I apologize for not saying more about these, the richness of these papers. So my medium as a historian is language. It's everyone's medium at this conference is language. My medium is language especially as articulated or used by people in the 16th and 17th centuries or in the 18th century as well. And by language, I mean not just words, but also images. And when I'm teaching, I was really delighted to hear Melissa 
who was actually once briefly a, suffered through my intellectual, my American religious history course. Uh, maybe you learned all this from me, Melissa. Maybe, who, who knows? Um, it's, it's, it's a challenging task to take students back from their subject position in 1990s or the early 21st century back to the language world of, let's say, someone delivering a spiritual relation before a congregation in Massachusetts in 1640. That's a challenge. That's a hurdle. That's a high hurdle. It's like trying to read Shakespeare. Not quite as difficult, but close. At least they've been taught to respect Shakespeare. So here's language. And the, the next point, the next lesson that I have to share with my students and share with myself as an historian is the indeterminacy of language. We all know that a poem doesn't have just one meaning. A Shakespeare play does not have just one meaning. There's no text that we can say we have exhausted the meaning of it. That's inherent in the very nature of language or symbol or metaphor or analogy. So that when I work with my students and bang, we hit the word, the Antichrist, I have to explain this is not very well documented in scripture, but it sure meant a lot to the people we're talking about in the 17th century. What did it mean? And it's a contested word that has no direct bearing in their lives but is just all over the pages of what I'm teaching, used in different senses. The word restoration came up earlier today. My people use the word restoration, reform, returning to the first times, the primitive times. Of course, right off the bat, I have to explain primitive does not mean, op does not mean savage. It means first, <laughs> prime, first. New England's first fruits, biblical quotation. The, um, but then what does restoration or the primitive mean? And so just to give you, I'm gonna be very, very pedantic here. So the early Puritans said to Elizabeth and the bishops of the Church of England after 1558, they said, hey, you know, you stopped this reformation short. You stopped it short. You didn't get back to the first times. You've got all this junk left over from Catholicism, which is apostasy. Later on, Archbishop Laud said, you know, you guys never read the Church Fathers. And what we are doing as recovering the essence of Catholicism is validated by the Church Fathers and is even more apostolic than what you have claimed is apostolic. So the very meaning of restoration or reform becomes a deeply fought out issue in the politics of religion in the Tudor Stuart period and on to our own time. So words are complicated. And then let's say naively we say to ourselves, or I might say to myself, I'm going to go to Calvin and he's going to clarify this all. He's going to clarify everything. He's going to tell me exactly what these words mean. Well, the modern scholarship on Calvinism is very, very disenchanting in that regard. Uh, there's a scholar who I won't bother to quote who points out that Calvin contradicts himself in the meaning of baptism in two successive sections of the Institute. Two, they're, they're, they're joined, they're next to each other says two totally different things about the meaning of baptism. How can he do that? Well, I love the fact that, was it, was it Melissa who introduced the word contradictions here? Contradictions exist. Theologians are just as sloppy as the rest of us. And they're especially sloppy in the 17th century, the 16th century, and how they use the Bible. It's amazing how sloppy they are. Uh, by the way, there's a new group of younger evangelical historians who have the courage to point out just how sloppy they were. So the question of truth raised here is a question that I would just add to your mediating circumstances, your mediating dialectical aspects of the search or the affirmation of truth. The question of truth is for us now, and as historians, the question affected by language and the ambiguities, the inherent ambiguities of language. And I might add to this the point that uh, <coughs> Laurie Maffley Kipp was alluding to at the cl close of her remarks, the difficulties of narrative structure. What narrative structure can possibly contain all that we know about the past? 
all that we have discovered in our research. What story can encompass those things? A story has to have a beginning and a middle and an end. But those stories are always, always partial, always incomplete. So as a historian, I start from the assumption that we are, that my very being is rooted in history. My body is historical. My family is historical. The institutions of which I am part are historical. The Harvard in which I teach is utterly different from the Harvard to which I attended as a student in the 1950s, and it's mutating with a phenomenal speed, for better or for worse. So we're rooted, I'm rooted in history, and I'm very, very aware that what I write is contingent uh, on, on, on paradigms or what I bring to the, what I bring to the table from various circumstances, some of which I'll to, I will allude to in a moment. And so in that sense, I agree that we are caught, we are limited by our subject position. But I learn from my teachers, and I teach to my students, and I believe completely that the historian can also transcend his or her subject position, can also go beyond his subject position. You are not simply the sum of your subject position. The historian can discover better sources, sources that change the story, change what we know. The historian can encounter a better paradigm and change what we know. The historian can turn his or her capacities of criticism on existing paradigms and show their limitations. If I may, if I may refer to Melissa again here, <laughs> sorry Melissa, but I had the privilege of being one of the readers of Melissa's dissertation in which she brilliantly, with the aid of her LDS context background, brilliantly demolishes a crucial paradigm of the study of Chinese Christianity and of Chinese religion, namely the, the category of native or indigenous religion. It's a beautiful piece of of criticism done without flamboyance, without personality, just a beautiful uh, example of how an historian can reshape how we understand the past. And that's happening all around us all of the time. And many of you here have contributed. It's been marvelous to hear how many of you are active, involved in, in rethinking and re affirming and rethinking at the same time the history of the LDS church. Can I just give you a couple of examples to what your appetite here for the best that historians can do, the good work that historians can do? And I'll give you some bad examples in a moment. But I want to encourage you here, nurture you here. So if you work in the field of Puritan studies, you know that the Puritans got a very bad name in the 19th century. They had a bad name already in the 17th century, but in the 19th century, they had a very bad name from high church Anglicans. <laughs> high church Anglicans, Anglo-Catholics. In the late 19th century, a, couple, a group of these Anglo-Catholic historians said in print that no British theologian had been sent by James I to the Senate of Dort in Dortrecht in 1618. No one had gone to that Senate. And this was important for them to say because it meant that the Church of England had never been tainted never experienced the taint, the disastrous taint of the Reformed tradition. So about 10 years ago, the marvelous younger British historian, Anthony Milton, published the entire records of the British delegation <laughs> to the Senate of Torrington. Big, thick book. And that's how I know about the Anglican historians from him. James I, sending you off. Go to the Senate of Dort. Sign the statement. Sign it. I don't want you to come back at home and whimper and say, I don't want to sign it. Go home and sign that thing. Sign that thing. They signed it with a couple of qualifications, but they did sign it. Another good example is Quakers. George Fox, sort of like a Joseph Smith, thought that he had experienced uh, a realized eschatology. He was living in the time of, uh, of the, the earth had become a new, a new Jerusalem. And he thought he could raise people from the dead. And he wrote a book about that, a manuscript book, which after he died, the Quakers hid. They were embarrassed by this man's prophetic 
claims, divine-like powers. Not until the 20th century did a Quaker dare to publish this book. After he died, he's left his journal. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, now I'm getting into the bad part. I skipped over, oh, I, I'm getting into the bad part. Or the good part, maybe it's both bad and good. Not until the 20th century, when, when his journal was published in the 1690s by Quakers, all the really ecstatic parts were edited out. Not until the 20th century did we get a complete critical edition of the journal. When Jonathan Edwards, who I understand is going to be mentioned tomorrow by one of the speakers, uh, Dick Brown, when Jonathan Edwards published his life of David Brainerd, the young, extraordinary missionary to the Native Americans, who incidentally was fianced to his daughter, who died of tuberculosis six, months after, six weeks after he died of TB in her house, when he, when he wrote his life of David Brainerd, he had at hand the complete manuscript of David Brainerd's journal. We know, thanks to the editorial work of my friend and graduate school classmate, Norman Pettit, that he left out all the juicy bits. He, didn't, he was so intent that Brainerd not be seen as a new light, an ecstatic, Holy Spirit-filled new light, which he was, that he edited out all those parts. He rewrote the journal and, and actually literally left out most of it. And I might say that uh, since the word woman's history has come up, it's going to come up again. In the 1970s, it was a woman historian who realized that Edwards had redacted his wife's spiritual narrative, completely redacted it when he published it in some, some thoughts concerning the revival in New England, leaving out her gender, leaving out all the specifics of her visions, just treating her as a kind of holy, super holy person who was totally moral. And when you look at the original text, it's a completely different text, a completely different kind of text altogether. So my point here is twofold. Historians have an obligation to look fearlessly at whatever is before them. I really, I really do believe that. And, and progress is actually made. There's a cumulative progress. There are also setbacks. Right now, we're in a setback period. But progress is generally made. I'm not a Whig, but there's a progress is made in certain key areas. Absolutely. So I, aff I, I applaud the recognition of that among those of you who are doing LDS history. And I want to just say here as a Christian myself, and I'm going to turn out of my spiritual history, that the Christian tradition seems to me to have sanctioned earlier, earlier than was mentioned before, seems to have sanctioned critical historical work without worrying about its effect on the truth. I was just in France doing the uh, pilgrimage road, not as, not as a pilgrim pilgrim, but as a pilgrim. And uh, that's as I wanted to walk. The, uh, and you come to churches, famous church, Conk, where there's a reliquary, the best reliquary in France. It was stolen at one point in time, and there was dispute of whether the relics of St. Foy really were inside this thing. A dispute broke out, legitimate or illegitimate. This was in the 12th century. So the Catholic Church has experienced all kinds of controversy, which we might call not scientific history or modern history, but nonetheless historical dispute. And when real critical history arose in the 16th century with Erasmus and the humanists and texts of the scripture were questioned, and then later on with other groups, sure, truth went out the window, Christian faith went out the window for some people. But the Christian tradition has survived and Catholicism has survived pretty well actually, despite all that. Now, in terms of my own faith, so I was baptized as an infant in a church that no longer exists, the Presbyterian Church U.S. I give somebody a dollar if you can decipher what that is. That was the Presbyterian Church U.S. It was the schism that goes back to the pre-Civil War period when the Presbyterian Church split and the U.S. was the southern branch. I was living in Virginia. And I was very proud of being us, Presbyterian Church, us. I thought that was terrific, us. Anyway, I was baptized in that church. My family, my father was one of the three founding families of the Home Mission Church. And in that church, which was named the Westminster Presbyterian Church, still exists, there was placed a huge steel engraving owned by my great-great-grandfather, who was a minister in Massachusetts, of the Westminster Assembly. Whether it's still there or not, I rather doubt given various circumstances. So I grew up and I knelt at my bedside and prayed and with a little boy who knelt by his bedside to pray every night, 
and went to church and Sunday school every Sunday without fail, mutated into someone who didn't go to church and didn't pray. And that was fine. But then I had kids, got married and had kids, and I thought, well, maybe they should get baptized. They got baptized in a non, non, sort of non-denominational way. And uh, then something happened that uh, the Bushmans know something about. Suffering entered my life in an unexpected way through a crisis of mental health with one of my children. And I had the extraordinary experience of more or less living in a mental health hospital for a year, daily visits, meeting a great many people who were ill, but whose difference for me was like this. I mean, one, one neuron, one, one something or other was the distance between me and them. But theirs was a tragic situation. There were suicides, women who committed suicide in that hospital by, pill by pillaging meds from the med carts. That couldn't happen now, I think. And then later on, I found myself in a setting that I'm willing to bet none of you have experienced. Namely, I was at the great AA center in Hazelden, Wisconsin. I'm sorry, uh, Minnesota, in the family program. And this was, I realized about a day after I got there, this was what it would like to be in purgatory, or maybe hell. Not that I was in hell, but I was living amongst people who were, or had been, living in hell as hopeless alcoholics or drug addicts. And the stories of suffering, of the suffering they had inflicted on others, the suffering inflicted on them that led them to become alcoholics. I'll tell you, if you ever thought the people were sinners, all the evidence you needed was right there before your very eyes. And there was another kind of evidence before my very eyes, and that was the immense power of family love. I was there because of my son. There were five children there because of their mother. There were grandparents there because their daughter, if she failed this program, her children were going to be taken by the state. They would never see them again. These are the kinds of stories that you encounter. And then you encounter spiritual testimonies when you start going to AA meetings. Richard Bushman, I heard him in Boston some years ago, refer to early LDS testimonies that you described hearing. So here I am, a student of religious testimony, reading them, you know, 17th century, to hear alcoholics reclaimed by AA describe their histories is to hear almost pure, without, without their having read a word of either scripture or knowing about the 17th century, you're hearing spiritual testimonies of the most extraordinary kind. Stories of loss, suffering, pain, wanting to kill themselves. And then the miraculous something that happens, sometimes spoken of as God interfering or the Holy intervening or the Holy Spirit intervening, sometimes not. So I went back to church and uh, had another experience, which is to lose a wife to cancer. And the church was very, very important in that process. Part of the church was very important, the minister, the, the, the liturgy, the worship, the healing services. And out of this has come two, two, just two, two points for me. I don't worry about the Trinity. I don't wake up in the middle of the night and worry about the Trinity. I don't worry about the authority of scripture. Don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Uh, I don't even have to worry about whether I'm saved. I don't worry about that either. I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I'm surrounded by sinners that we're leading broken lives and we need grace. We need something outside ourselves. And secondly, I know that the church offers something that it offers incorporation. It offers an immensely powerful set of rituals of incorporation, of which the most important, the one I've written about at some length and intend to write about more, is baptism. I cry when I see children baptized. It's such a powerful rite of incorporation because it affirms continuity, life continuities, and I understand why it's so important to LDS people, even if their own particular version of baptism is different from the one that I affirm, that, I, that I'm committed to. But I'm committed to the church as a community that offers healing rituals. I know that within the church, I'm saved. And that my children and my grandchildren are saved. That's what I know from the church. 
And going back to the Bushmen, so this is why I can evoke various silent, unspoken situations that we have passed through in our separate ways. I should say that it was my great, great pleasure to meet Richard in a very singular moment. Spring of 1958, I was graduating from Harvard College and I had my oral examination in an honors field. And there was Oscar Hanlon, the famous professor, and there was one of my tutors, and there was this man with these kind of lustrous eyes, young man with lustrous eyes, and at the first question I bogged down. It was a miserable experience. I couldn't answer a single question. And this man's eyes grew more and more sort of luminous and moist, and I could feel him kind of yearning to do something. And I never heard his name, but it was Richard Bushman. He was on my exam. It was, it was your very first exam, right? And for him, it was as, as miserable experience. Actually, it was more miserable for him than it was for me. I was just so glad to have it over with. <laughs> later on, we met again because we met through our common scholarship. And later still, thanks to the old boy network, I was hired by a committee he chaired at Boston University. And also because of the old boy network, he was, uh, became the only, only reader of my then book and manuscript and marvelously transformed it. We taught together. Teaching together, uh, which only happened once, but it was an uh, important experience for both of us. I know I'm talking too long. Uh, because it, 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 it introduced me to Richard's sense of the particular. It was a seminar on Federalist Boston using only primary sources. And it was a challenge for both of us. We'd never taught a course like that before. Not, Richard has gone, went on then to do more work with very special, particular historical sources, and that led him then to furniture and houses and many more things since. And of course, Joseph Smith was always uh, there as a kind of partner, or the book, book project was always a kind of a silent partner or active partner at various points in time. And so there was, I would say, an aesthetics, an aesthetics of doing history that may have been nascent in me, but was ripened and enriched by working alongside, alongside Richard. And I should say also that uh, my own natural temperament is a little more aggressive than his, so that it was like the old elephant and the young elephant side by side, the young elephant learning compassion from the old elephant. And you're not that old, Richard, but you're right. And you're not like elephant-like. And I want to say just a word here about Claudia. <laughs> because I can truly say that I had the unique experience of being her thesis director. But the really important point to make about Claudia is that she was at Boston University at a moment when women's history was literally just beginning. And she was part of a cohort of women, not fresh out of college, but a little beyond, beyond college in various ways, who knew they were damn smart people, but had been raising families, and not sure whether they could get into a Harvard if they said they wanted to do women's history. In fact, it would have been certain they would not have gotten into Harvard if they said they wanted to do women's history. And I said with my total innocence, do whatever you want to do. T total, total, total innocence. And bang, Boston University, this program, American States Program, produced one third of the PhDs in women's history in the 1970s in the United States of America, of which Claudius was one. And it's a beautiful book she wrote. She wrote it not on LDS, she wrote it on Harriet Hanson Robinson, a formidable social, cultural critic of her own time in the middle of the 19th century. It's a terrific book. Go read it. So Claudia was a force to reckon with. In some ways, yeah, yeah, you were a force to reckon with, Claudia. Yeah, you were, you pushed me, right? I pushed you, you pushed me, right? Yep, you said to me one day, I'd like to teach. I said, well, you're only a, you're only a graduate student. I'd, I'd like to teach. Remember that? I went to the dean and I said, I got, I, I, I got a problem on my hands. I got these women who want to teach. How do we, how do we, how do we set this up? Well, we found a way, they found a way. So I just want to say by closing here that it's been a great privilege to be part of this program, a great privilege to honor the LDS tradition, the, honor, the LDS traditions of critical scholarship and of caring for a faith community, which is not my own faith community. I want to honor the Bushmans in particular for their, the richness of their lives and the richness of their connections that I've benefited from so much. Thank you very much.